Hi, everyone. This is Miki Tsusaka from BCG Tokyo. I am BCG's Chief Alumni Officer, and today I am excited to be hosting our ninth BCG Alumni Leaders Program. Today, I am really, really excited to see a really good friend, an old friend, Michael Hansen. Michael moved to the New York office where he was a partner and managing director, and he left us in the year 2000. Since then, he has done many things, and today he is the CEO of Sengage, an educational technology company. After he successfully transformed them to become a, uh, from a being a traditional print publisher to a technology platform company, uh, Michael is now at the forefront of disrupting the industry and shaping the way students learn through a really different quality digital experience. So welcome, Michael. Thank you for joining us today. Um, Thank you, Mickey. Thanks for having me. We'll be uh, chatting about uh, a whole range of things, including your career path, how you've gone through the transformation, uh, career lessons and learnings from the past. But maybe we start with uh, what you're up to th th these days. What is it that you do at Cengage? So what we do at Cengage is essentially falls into two categories. Uh, one is we are supplying learning materials. And as you said, primarily uh, these days digitally through students that are in traditional education path. They are in colleges, uh, they're in vocational schools, uh, and they are also in high school. So that's what we're focusing on, high school and, 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 and further. And the second thing we do, and this is an area that we are very excited as, about, is we are actually supplying online direct learning experience through our Ed2Go platform, where students have an ability for uh, much less money and in less time to acquire very specific skills that are relevant for their job to either advance or enter into a new job. So those are the two broad, I would say, categories that we're focused on as a business. Great. Uh, I'd love to hear a bit more about the transformation that I've mentioned earlier about transforming the traditionally print company to such a dynamic digital uh, learning platform. How did the transformation happen? How did the turnaround influence the culture of the company? Uh, can you speak a little bit about that? Well, I think that the headline is rough and tumble and it never goes the way that you think it's going to go. In other <laughs> words, uh, you can plan. And then uh, I think there is an old Jewish expression this, uh, you know, man plans and, and God laughs. In other words, you are always surprised by, by things that are happening along the way. But I, I do think that um, one of the important lessons that I've learned, and uh, that certainly was the case at, uh, at Cengage, you got to start with the culture of the organization. A lot of people, and certainly all of us with a very analytical and strategic background from BCG, uh, will tend to migrate to analytics, to uh, what's the right strategy, et cetera. And all of that is hugely important. Um, but if you do not realize that without a culture, you cannot drive this transformation because you are actually losing people. You're losing people, you're losing their hearts and minds. Uh, many people have grown up in a traditional print publishing model, and it's a very different experience than a technology company, than a very much digital first strategy. So the first thing you really gotta do is understand where the culture is, and what it takes to move the culture into that new business model and, and into, into this new era. Great. Well, I, I know one of the things that influences the culture of a company is indeed the people and the talent that you know, define and shape the culture. Diversity is one of those topics that I know you've been passionate about for a long time, but perhaps you can also build on your discussion around culture and talk a little bit about uh, the efforts you've made to recruit, train, um, retain diverse talent at Cengage. Yeah, so let me give you a little bit. I think history is important here. So when I joined Cengage, uh, Cengage was um, pretty much in free fall from a business perspective, mm -hmm. uh, from a culture perspective. Um, we were sliding into bankruptcy and I was recruited in 2012. And the most important part, there were lots of issues on the balance sheets with the business model, all of those quote unquote hard facts. But the most important part was that people had lost confidence that they can actually impact the direction of the company, that their work actually made a difference. So while we were you know, filing for chapter 11, 
recruiting a new uh, a new management team and starting to turn out the business model one of the things we started in parallel is an effort around figuring out what really the culture of the place was and why were people were coming to work and this was a year long effort where we focused on building the answer to the question why do you show up for work and why sengage why sengage and why now that was the question we asked and we talked to over 1500 people in the organization in group discussions and out came after a year a statement that still guides us to this place which is our credo and mm -hmm. the credo really expresses why people are passionate about being at sengage and being in education and it starts we believe in the power and joy of learning mm -hmm. and that was very important for us to have a starting point and an anchor point so to speak so I think this notion for me is so important that I think contrary to what people believe, culture is not dictated top down. Culture is not what the CEO comes up with and then tries to indoctrinate the US organization. Culture is the answer to the question, why is this company, this organization, a good platform for your unique talents? Why is BCG a great platform for your talents? And why is Sengage a good platform for other people's talents? So I think that answer and really codifying and agreeing on that answer and talking about it was very much a motor of a lot of the things that we ended up doing, you know, with a balance sheet, with a business model, with all of those things. And then let me do a quick pivot to the question that you asked about diversity. I think the same applies to diversity. That, you know, if, if people truly believe and particularly the leadership in the organization believes that diversity advances the mission of the company, advances the success of business. Then you approach it like a business problem and you mm -hmm. will focus on it and you will ultimately have the longevity to stay with it and really make a change. And we started from a much less diverse starting point within Sengage. Yes. Uh, it was the provenance of mostly white people, um, you know, the gender balance was there. We had as many women as we had men, but what we had is a predominance of white people and we were certainly not reflective of our customer base. We're making progress, we're not there yet, but we're making progress, but we're seeing it as a business problem. Great, well, thank you for sharing those thoughts. The notion around credo purpose, I think is actually rather in vogue these days, but I think you had the foresight to start with that. Uh, I guess so almost now 10 years ago. Almost 10 years ago. It's a long, it's a long time ago. <laughs> um, but I'm sure as a leader, you've had many, many challenges and you've spoken to some of the major transformative efforts you've put in place. But if you reflect back, uh, what are some of the key leadership challenges you faced and how did you overcome them? Well, you're right, there were many challenges along the way. And this transformation that you talked about, Mickey, from print to digital, <clears throat> it sounds great as a headline, but <laughs> in our case, it was uh, littered along the way with setbacks. And I'm mm -hmm. not gonna go into a lot of the details, but you know, the market has been, for different reasons, very resistant to embrace digital. And by the market, I mean faculty, administration in a college, and less so to a lesser extent, the students. So we had to transform the business model to not only say, oh, we've got great new features, but we also had to focus on making those products much more affordable because the vast majority of students, and I'm talking about the US, but it's true around the world, they are, their biggest problem with education is affordability. I just can't afford it. I, it's too expensive. It takes too long. I, I have a job. I need to get create income. And you know, you and I might be thinking about an 18 to 22 year old, your kids, my kids. That mm -hmm. is not the majority of people anymore. The majority is a 35 year old mother, single mother who has a job and goes to a community college to get some mm -hmm. advancement and get a degree that she can then take to the labor market and make a better living for her and her family. So affordability was very much something we put in the center alongside of digital and really use the way of bringing more affordable course materials to students as a way to also show them, actually digital is not only more affordable, but it is also better. It's a better learning experience. It's more customized to your individual needs. 
So very much setbacks along uh, uh, along the way where the market has been very resistant and we thought digital should be growing by you know 20 percent and for a while it grew 10 percent year over year so it was a much much slower transition than we thought what got me through it <clears throat> uh honestly i think what got all of us through it was listening listening to each other with a with an open mind to change your mind and really be conscious, not only listen to your customers, which you always should do, but listen to the organization, listen to my team. And I'm blessed with, with a team that I've worked with, some of them uh, from BCG, as you know, and uh, you know we are probably on a per capita basis, one of the bigger BCG alumni organizations these days. <laughs> but uh, I will say that uh, you know the, the, the listening part, the, the openness to listen to other people's point of view uh, and, and Embedded then in the strategy, I think is the probably the single biggest uh, the single biggest uh, feature of what gets you through these situations. No, thank you so much for sharing that, and we love to see our alumni successful everywhere. And I'm glad you have uh, your fair share, and even more, Michael. Um, turning our attention to now, what's next? Um, we are living in some incredible and uncertain times. Uh, given the pandemic and all, but what are indeed the key industry trends you're paying now attention to, to figure out ways to survive and thrive in the new reality of the this decade ahead of us? So, uh, great question, Mickey. Let me separate the answer into two parts, for the organization itself and then for our market and for our customers. So, for mm -hmm. the organization itself, what was interesting about the pandemic is what you and I talked about a minute ago in terms of the importance of culture mm -hmm. that played out in the pandemic in a beautiful way. And I am so proud of the organization. We literally on March 12th went with four and a half thousand people to a work from home model without me saying anything about this. This was like done at the much lower levels of the organization because everybody knew what we would how we would prioritize is health of our employees first, and then secondly, the support of our customers, right? And we went, literally 95% of people went within 24 hours remote, and there's not been a hiccup. We have, I mean, I have been back to an office, I think, once for like three hours, and that's about it. And it has worked seamlessly. And importantly, in that time, we were really supporting our customers who were facing unprecedented challenges. Just imagine mm -hmm. this. You are a, uh, you know, you're a professor in, take any, take, uh, take Boston, Bunker Hill Community College. You have never thought about teaching remote. Now everybody's gone and your students are still there expecting you to teach. So we needed to help them to get online and not just get on Zoom and do, you know, some, mm -hmm. some lecture, but set up the courses in a different way, refashion the courses. So we did that. And it was an incredible display of, of the culture that, that all of us here at, at Sengage have built. Uh, so it was a real wake up call as for everybody. Uh, and I think if I pivot to our, our clients and the colleges, where you think we have learned so much about how to deal with COVID, this is the biggest week. Today is actually the biggest day of back to school in the United States. And the vast majority of people are still woefully unprepared for that. Mm. Woefully unprepared. The Delta variant, oh my God, what does it mean? Mm. We're not going back to the way we did things? No, we're staying hybrid. Okay, so we might have some classes that we're doing online, some other classes we're doing in person. So it's still a mad scramble. And frankly, this is what's consuming us uh, night and day right now to yet again go through another back to school season where we have to deliver... Uh, incredible support to our customers, faculty in particular, but also the administration to help them actually have a meaningful semester this year. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for sharing those thoughts as well. Um, let me finish this um, really interesting discussion, Michael, with one last question. What is uh, the single best piece of advice that you have received during your career? Be nice if it was a BCG story, but it doesn't have to be. My first day at work was Sandy Moose in the uh, in the Third Avenue office uh, when I when I came in and I was uh, surprised and shocked that I got recruited uh, as a German uh, straight out of business school into BCG New York. So um, I was literally walking in, and and you know Sandy, I I I um, 
she has been a great influence, I think, for both of us. And I do remember a, a piece of advice that that uh, she gave me, which which stuck with me. And and there are so many things I've learned in my BCG career, but but one uh, that really stuck with me that Sandy said was when she reflected on it, she said, "Michael, always prioritize and focus. Prioritize and focus. Don't bite off too much. Focus on." the one issue that you really want to solve and then go after it. And she was really very big about, you know, prioritization as opposed to wandering around. And I found that uh, a very, um, a very helpful advice on disciplining yourself to try not to bite off too much, figure out what really moves the needle and then stay with it and doggedly be in pursuit of that. Uh, and I thought that was great advice, but I, I, don't think I would do BCG justice uh, if I didn't say that. Uh, look, I was when I came to to the US to to go to Colombia. I was a lawyer by training. I didn't know the first thing about business, so everything that I know about <laughs> business uh, that taught was taught to me by BCG, and most importantly, it was taught to me by all the incredibly uh, gifted uh, uh, gifted colleagues that I had the pleasure of working with, of which you are one. I remember our times in. Uh, various uh, in various projects together, so uh, it's really gave me the uh, the, the the wings, and uh, and I'll be f forever grateful for that. Well, thank you for that, Michael. Yes, no, um, we've all learned and taught each other a lot of things back in the day. We've learned a lot from Dr. Moose <laughs> collectively. We did. <laughs> Um, thank you. Thank you, Michael. This was a fantastic conversation. I really enjoyed it. I'm sure the audience was, will as well. And I look forward to speaking with another great alumni next month. Thank you for joining me then. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for having us. Thank you.